Uh, well, good evening and um, welcome to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. My name is Carrie Morgan and I'm the gallery director here and I also have the pleasure of being the program director for the McKnight Visual Artist Fellowships. So I'm very pleased to be here telling you a little bit about what these fellowships entail. And I wanna make this as useful for you as possible. So although I have like slides and um, a program per se, um, you're also welcome to raise your hand and ask a question as you are thinking of it. Um, and I'm happy to, to answer anything that you have. You know, if I'm gonna be talking about exactly the thing you, you want to talk about in the next minute, I might ask you to pause. Um, but otherwise, we are video recording this because um, a lot of people who apply for the McKnight don't live in the Twin Cities, they live out in greater Minnesota. And so this is an opportunity for them to just to hear your questions. So I really would encourage you to, if you have questions or if things aren't clear, um, or if you want more information, just, just ask. And before you, we do start, um, I try to make a, a, a point of just mentioning that the Minneapolis College of Art and Design is, um, is a college that is on Dakota land. Originally, this belonged to the Dakota people, and I want to just pay respects um, to, to that fact before we um, proceed. So the McKnight information session. We have a second one that's coming up a week from today at Springboard for the Arts, if you are in um, St. Paul. And what is the McKnight Artist Fellowships? More broadly, the McKnight Foundation is a very generous foundation that funds all kinds of activities, not just in the state of Minnesota, but globally. But their work that they do for the fine arts um, is focused here in, in state. And um, these particular fellowships that uh, we administer here, and then there are um, nine other organizations around the Twin Cities that have their own McKnight fellowships for different disciplines, such as writing and composers and dancers. There's one for ceramic artists in particular. Um, we are all kind of overseen by um, the McKnight Foundation. And um, these particular fellowships are have been around since 1981 and they were established to help artists in the state of Minnesota set aside time for study and reflection, experimentation, and exploration. And um, we're hoping that artists take the time to take advantage of new opportunities and to work on new projects. Each year, the McKnight Foundation contributes, I think, over a million dollars um, to these individual artists just through these 10 fellowship programs. These grants are $25,000 each, um, the one that I oversee here at McKnight um, this year is for eight artists um, and the other organizations that oversee theirs, um, they range between offering two fellowships um, to three to four and we're the largest um, because we encompass the, the visual arts um, most broadly. So what is the purpose? I think I kind of alluded to that already. Um, but the McKnight Foundation wants us to identify and reward outstanding Minnesota artists who have an established record of artistic success. And um, this program that I oversee um, supports mid-career artists and established artists by providing financial assistance, professional criticism from outside visiting critics who fly to the Twin Cities to meet with our artists, uh, publicity um, in terms of having won the fellowship, and then we also publicize um, our upcoming McKnight Visual Artist Discussion Series, and we also give them the opportunity for other professional development. So here are the components more specifically. $25,000 cash reward award is um, given to the recipient and they can use it however they, they wish. Uh, you don't have to keep receipts and um, we hope that it will help just benefit you, but you might be able to put a down payment on a new car or maybe it's providing health insurance or maybe it's a lot of artists um, use the money to enhance their studio spaces, often to rent new spaces or build out spaces, but it's really a cash gift. A part of the other perks, if you win one of the McKnight Fellowships, is that um, you get visits from, as I mentioned, six visiting critics, and they are often curators and artists, um, writers, arts writers, or other types of arts professionals. And the fellows who are selected, the eight, get to come together and, and select who they want to come and visit them. So um, that's an opportunity um, that's quite unique. Also, we have an opportunity to invite back four of the visiting critics to participate in McKnight discussion series. And what we do is we pair two of the fellows and they work with one of the other, with one of the critics, um, and they develop a discussion on the topic of their choosing. 
You also have the chance, if you're a, a fellowship recipient, to use the funding towards an individually focused professional development, such as travel, maybe exhibition expenses, um, a website creation. So, the, and, and so it's basically an additional three thousand dollars that you um, can. Up, you just ask and tell me how you want to use it, and then I make sure that it seems that it would benefit you as professional development, and you can use it at any time during um, the fellowship period. So, as I mentioned, um, one of the big components now of our of this fellowship is this McKnight discussion series. So we spend our first, this is basically a two-year fellowship where in the first year, once you win it, you get to meet with six visiting critics, and then as a group, you decide to bring back four. And as I say, we pair two fellows with one critic. And then we have a four-part discussion series. And we're hoping that this is a chance to really develop a little deeper a connection to a curator or to an arts writer who really enjoyed meeting you and would like um, to have the opportunity to come back a second time. And we are gonna have our upcoming session um, this spring at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. So it's our neighbor just across, um, we, we share grass. I mean, they're part of the same campus as us. And so we're very excited about that opportunity to be in their Pillsbury Auditorium. So um, these are going to happen on different Fridays, Friday evenings. Um, they're going to happen at 6.30 p.m. The first one is coming up on February 16th, um, where Christian Viveris Fone, who's an, an independent curator and arts writer based in New York City, is going to be in conversation with our two fellows, Leah Edelman Breyer and Monica Haller. And so Leah and Monica are winners from 2000 and 16 so the so it seems like we're really far behind but we're really not it just means that you get this much longer to to make new work and have a chance to think about it and, and share it with others um, our next uh, session will be on March 23rd and that's when Andrea Hickey will be here in conversation with Pa Hua Her and Caroline Kent and Andrea Hickey is a curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland and she used to be she used to work at the Walker Art Center on April 6th, Jamila James, who is a curator at um, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, and um, she'll be in conversation with Tia Simone Gardner and Jay Hykus on April 6th. And then finally, June 1st, um, we have Harag Vartanian, who is the co-founder and editor of Hyperallergic, which is a very popular and unsuccessful online uh, news source for artists. And he's going to be in conversation with Eric Benson and Julie Buffalohead. So I hope you'll come to those um, these discussions and give you a chance to learn a little bit more about our fellows and the and also more importantly not more importantly but as importantly is really just to give you a sense of like who uh, to, to bring some of these these nationally recognized kind of curators just to come and speak and hear what are they interested in and just to see kind of what lovely human beings they usually are um, I think people are often intimidated thinking that if you live on either coast or you have like you work for big name institutions that somehow you're not really approachable but I, th I think they really are and um, this gets, gives you a chance to, to learn a little bit more about some of these these curators and, and arts writers. So eligibility so this is back to um, we've kind of covered some of the, the perks if you win one of the fellowships um, but how now back to the kind of nuts and bolts of applying. Um, first of all, eligibility. So um, for this particular McKnight Fellowship, you need to be an artist who works um, in the visual arts, and um, it can be traditional, it can be you know painting, it can be sculpture, mixed media, you can do video work. But if you do, uh, if you're a, a filmmaker or if you're a theater artist, you know there are actually other McKnight Fellowships that you should be applying for. And if you do work in ceramic arts, there is one that the Northern Clay Center does. So you can learn more about that to see if that might be a better fit for what um, you're, you'd be interested in. Um, you must be a resident of Minnesota. You have to have lived in the state for at least a year before you apply, um, before the application deadline. And it's fine for you to reside outside of the Twin Cities. This is certainly open to everyone in the state. Um, however, just because of logistics, most of the studio visits, if you're selected to be a fellow, they do have to happen here in the Twin Cities. If you live within an hour, that's fine. But um, often if you're four hours, we've had artists from um, Duluth and Park Rapids, um, Lesseur, Mankato. Um, very often they have to come to the Twin Cities. Sometimes we can get to them, but um, Anyways, we, we do make it work, and we also compensate any fellow for all their mileage and lodging and food and some things like that. So we try to make it so it's not an economic hardship to have to come and do studio visits with these visiting critics. 
you also are supposed to be beyond emerging. And we define em um, that as having at least eight years of some type of professional experience, you know, outside of doing it in a, in a, in a school-sponsored setting. And um, an example of that could be having been included in regional or national gallery and museum exhibitions. Um, you could have received other fellowships or awards or Minnesota State Arts Board grants. So it's like some evidence that you've been putting yourself out there and have been active as a professional artist for a minimum of eight years. Um, you're not supposed to be enrolled in a degree-seeking program at the time of applying because we want the focus to be on making time for yourself to do, to take the cash award, to do things that you otherwise may not be able to do, um, and to also kind of um, take advantage of the mentorship that will be coming through, hopefully working with, meeting with cohorts, your other fellows, and then having these visiting critics. So um, you can be a part of a collaborative group and apply. You don't have to be an individual artist. But you have to split the money. So you have to, the $25,000 gets divided by all the people in the collaborative. So the application process. Um, our deadline is uh, Friday, March 30th at noon. And we have an online application that you can go to. It's open now, so you're welcome to go and check it out if you have not already. And um, that link is, is noted www.mcad.edu backslash McKnight. Um, we try to make the application process as easy as possible. You need to have 10 images that you can upload to our online server. Um, we do have it um, set so that you do need to format your images and this can be tricky um, and at the end of this presentation I can talk about the technical aspects of making your images fit on the specific dimensions that we require. Um, the longest dimension, so if you make a, a painting and it's horizontal, then the longest dimension um, needs to be 1920 pixels. Or if you make something vertical, a sculpture or something, that um, your image of that piece needs to be um, 1920 pixels. Oh, and if you have a video, if you're a video maker, um, you're welcome to apply. Um, but we ask that you have to represent your work in one of the 10 images. And then you, there is a place where you can upload up to two YouTube links. And um, these links are supposed to be no more than three minutes each. And this link can be a compilation of multiple uh, segments of your video. And the idea of a video, though, isn't um, like a walk around your studio. It's not an interview on MN Original. It's not meant to be um, some kind of um, publicity for you, but rather the idea that you do video or time-based work or kinetic work, or maybe you do sound-based work that you can only capture um, through having some kind of audio uh, visual component. So that's what the video is, is meant to provide you with. Um, so that's an optional part of the application. Everyone is required to upload a resume, and it can be as long as you want it to be, and it can be formatted however you want it to be too, just make it legible. Um, you do need to have an artist statement. And we ask that it be no more longer than a page, but it's not as if the system's gonna cut you off if it is. Our, our system doesn't know if it's longer than a page, but we're asking you to do that for the sake of the jurors. And um, uh, because usually whatever you need to say in an artist statement should be able to be said on, a, on one single sheet of paper. We do ask that you include a brief description of what you hope to accomplish during your fellowship year. So you may talk about you know, who you are, what it is you do, and why you do it. But you also should say, to give the jurors an idea of if you get this fellowship, what are you going to be working on in the upcoming year? Like, so that they have a sense that, oh, you have, a, you have an idea in mind. Because um, they know that a part of the perk is that you're going to be getting these six visiting critics in. And if you're kind of haven't gotten to the point of thinking what's next, um, or just being able to talk about your work about moving it forward, then they may be, you know, we don't want to give them a reason not to give you the fellowship. So this gives them an idea about what you, your ambition as an artist, and what is it you're trying to do? What do you want to do? What do you, what, what's, what's your work up to? So um, we do ask you to do that. And also there's another optional uh, component, and that's an optional PDF. Because we've had a number of artists who do work that's very text-based, like they may write, they might provide label copy that is almost as integral to the work as some kind of visual component. Um, we also have artists who do like book arts that's very hard to show multiple um, images um, 
from a book, for example. So if you want to upload a PDF that might provide some kind of other context for work that otherwise would not be visible or legible or understandable in a single JPEG, then you're welcome to upload a PDF. We do ask that whatever's in that PDF has to be represented in those 10 images. Like it's not an opportunity for you just to add uh, an 11th or a 12th piece um, to your application, but rather it's to augment um, and make more clear what might already be in the standard, like 10 images um, and caption information that you um, provide. Are there any questions about the, the kind of the nuts and bolts of what we ask you to upload? Okay. Um, so selection criteria. Now the selection criteria are very broad and they're very subjective. Um, is the selection criteria that we, we mention in our online application. It's also the selection criteria that we provide to our jurors. So we ask our jurors, and I forgot to mention, I think it's on the next slide, but our jurors are, um, they're usually uh, one's an artist, usually one's an art historian or an arts writer, and the other one is a curator or a museum director. So they often approach the arts in, in different ways. And um, these jurors usually uh, come from different parts of the country and they're different ages. They might represent different races or ethnicities. They're usually different in terms of gender because we want as many kind of points of view kind of looking at um, these applications as possible. But we do ask these jurors, we say, you know, you need to select high quality work. But what that means to that particular juror, of course, nobody knows. So that's a lot of what you kind of just throw up to the world for chance, you know, it's, um, nobody knows. And it's not about just one artist, one juror's opinion, it ends up being about all three of them. So that makes it um, that much harder. Um, but we do mention that what's most important is your work samples. Because in the first round of jurying, those jurors must look at all of your images and if you have an optional video or an optional PDF, and they have access to your artist statement and they have access to your resume, but we don't require that they read them in the first round of applications. And the reason for that is we have usually between 200 and 250 applications. And when you have 10 images, that's already a lot to look at. Um, and um, we have really no way of knowing whether or not our jurors <laughs> would be looking at the resume and taking the time to read a long statement. So um, that's why we say what's most important are your work samples, the visuals that you provide for this application. The other selection criteria is evidence of serious commitment to artistic practice. And I say, you know, accomplishments to date as well as promise for continued development. And that's something that is going to be more visible if you make it to the second round of juring, which is when our jurors review your images a second time. And that's when they do read your artist statement and your resume. And the people who make it to the second round is usually the top 25 to 35 artists. And um, that's based on the jurors going through your application and assigning a number to you, one through five, with five being the highest. And I'll go, I'll go over this again in just a minute. But um, the third selection criteria is the impact the fellowship will have on the artist. And again, that might be indicated in maybe just the quality of your images. That they're like, wow, this artist is making really work. And it looks like we just want them to keep doing what they're doing. Or it might be that in your artist statement, you talked about how what you really need to do is have some time and money in order to, to travel someplace or to continue a project that you've just started on or maybe to complete a project that you're in the middle of. Um, but that's how they are going to have to, if the jurors have to try to think about how important is this fellowship to you to make possible the things you want to do. Um, we also ask the panel to consider the breadth of artistic practice among the artists, um, that, among the applicants, among the 200 or 250 of you who will apply. So they're supposed to um, think about, you know, selecting fellows or thinking about, um, uh, you know, rewarding art in, that's in different media that might represent different types of aesthetics and different types of traditions. Um, and also think about uh, in the breadth in terms of, you know, ethnicity, gender, and geography. And again, those are things that because these are blind submissions, they're not necessarily going to know um, that much about you unless you, you write about it in your artist statement. Or also, um, if you are um, lucky to have a studio visit, if you're a, a finalist, then obviously they meet you. And um, you know, that idea of diversity writ large in terms from media to age to, to you know, everything that you are um, kind of filters into that final selection process. But the jurors bring their own selection criteria to this process. And so this is something we often, we ask our jurors in the second round of jurying. Um, 
we asked them to share with us, like, what were you looking for in these applications? You know, what to you is um, outstanding artistic work? And it runs the gamut, um, but these are just a sampling of some of the things that some of our recent jurors have said. Um, one of the jurors said that they were looking for aesthetic and conceptual depth and substance. Um, they said they responded against formula. Uh, they didn't want to see something uh, 10 different, they didn't seem to like 10 different examples of the very same theme. Um, they were looking for artists who worked with materials in interesting ways while maintaining consistency. We get that a lot, this idea that something is, that there's consistency, like there's ideas that are, that they can tell that you're, you're, you're thinking through things, but yet the physical manifestation of it might, might vary. Um, another juror said they were looking for work that was innovative and pushed boundaries. Uh, particularly conscious about making sure the artwork presented was recent. And so that's, that's something people often ask, well, can I, can I include work that I did 20 years ago? And you can, but it, it may not help the jurors make the decision is like, what makes you need this fellowship now? So you, even if it, you're fine to have work if you, if you want it to be farther back for, for different reasons, but generally they're gonna wanna see a sense of like, what are you, what are you doing right now? You know, what is it that they want this $25,000 to help jumpstart and make possible for you? So that's kind of what that, I would say, that often means. And then they also need evidence that you're, you're you know, beyond emerging, that you're a mid-career level. And again, that varies a lot, because sometimes it, it's not about age, and it's not about X number of what, you know, there's, not, there's nothing that specific other than you need to have eight years of professional experience. And I mean, you could be in your, you could be 28 and have eight years of professional experience, or you could be 68. And um, we certainly have had fellows who run between um, that age range. Um, another juror said they were looking for work that read as contemporary, um, looking for a surprise or something unexpected. Um, another one said they were looking for robustness in the practice, a liveliness, um, variations of work, yet a cohesiveness. Um, they often say t they want something to be visually compelling. And again, most of this, you have no idea what is visually compelling to me. It could be different than what's visually compelling to you or the other 18 people in, the, in this space right now. And another juror said that diversity of practices and background was important. So, so in a way, I'll be honest, you know, me even caring, sharing this selection criteria with you, just, I think, just emphasizes again that, you know, how subjective this process is. And um, I mean, it's a reason to, if you apply for it one year, I think you should reapply next year because the jurors change every year and you just have no control over what it is they're gonna like or dislike. You know, they might have just seen some neon art someplace else and thought, gosh, I've already seen something just like this. And I mean, you had no idea that they just went to an exhibition and saw something that was like too close to, to what you were doing. Um, so, I mean, we, we hope that they kind of suspend, you know, and understand their own prejudices and, um, you know, look with fresh eyes, um, but, just know that it's it is a it's a very lucky process too. So, so these are our dates. I mentioned that the, the deadline is Friday, March thirtieth, and I kind of already outlined a little bit that this is a, a series of um, of distilling down your application from a first round to a second round to a final round to being a fellow. It's like this big sieve kind of thing where the um, in the first round of juring, the jurors are looking primarily at your images. They get two weeks. Uh, to look over all the materials, and then they score you one to five, and then we tabulate that. Um, so exam for example, the highest a person could get is a 15. And just to again say, how hard is it to get a 15? Um, I've, been, I've had the, the luck of being doing this job for nine years now, and uh, I've had one artist in the last nine years get a 15. <laughs> so um, that's out of a lot of applicants. So uh, um, that just shows you that what's a, what's a five to somebody might be a one to somebody else. And it's very often that our fellows who are actually selected in the first round actually got that from somebody. Because um, what happens is if you get a five from any one juror, we automatically put you into the semifinal round. Otherwise, we're tabulating it. So you might have gotten a four, four, four. So four times three is 12. Or maybe you got um, a three, three, um, four, because that's 10. Very often a score of 10 or 11 and above will put you in um, the semifinal round. And so a lot of it is just luck. It's one number. Like if only it's someone had given me a four instead of a three. And that's why I don't even tell people their scores because it just, it doesn't really, 
it's, it's a tool for deciding what did this particular group of, art, of jurors at this particular moment think about the work that they were looking probably pretty quickly at. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I think you, you do get a sense that there's, I mean, there's a wide range of art that these, these jurors end up liking. But at the second, so that's the first round. And then the top, as they say, 25 to 30, um, move on to the second round. And then we ask them to review it again. So they get another two weeks to look at the top 25 to 30. So they look at the images a second time. They read your, S, your artist statement. They look at your um, resume. And then we have a conference call. And over the two to three hours, we go through every single person's application. And they have to share with one another. It's a conference call, so they're talking to each other for the first time, You know what they liked or didn't like about the work. And that's where, that's where the person who might have given you a five and the person who give you a one they have the chance, the person who gave you a five has a chance to convince the person who gave you a one that you really are, you should move on in the process. So th that's where, again, it's totally haphazard and not one single person is in control of, of what gets done. Um, and we take notes, my, I have an, uh, an associate, uh, Melanie Pankow, who's the fellowship coordinator. She and I take notes um, during the, uh, this process and um, we jot down what everybody's saying. And then in the second round of juring, in addition, there's a place on the jurors interface where they have to write comments. And so it's a way for to prep them for the um, conference call. And also it's a way that I can kind of ask that they you know, make notes about, you know, what did you see in the resume? Or did you notice something in the artist statement? So I can kind of hold them accountable for, for reading these extra materials. Um, so in the second round, we go, th they go through all of the top applicants. We, they talk about them. And before we move on to the next person, we say, you know, do you want to do a studio visit? Do you yes to a studio visit? No to a studio visit? Or maybe to a studio visit? And we go through the, the top 25 to 30, and that's where they have to convince one another which are the ones they want to go do studio visits with. So that's the goal at the end of this two to three hour conference call is to have 12 people, well, no, excuse me, 16 people that we're going to do studio visits with. So that's what they do. And then what, we're, what you need to know is that we will send out a notification so you know how far you got in this process um, no later than Friday, May 11th. So we'll send out an email. If you just made it to the first round, I mean, you, and you, if you didn't make it to the second round, you'll get an email. Um, you'll get a second email, if a different type of email, if you made it to the second round of juring, because then I have the opportunity to provide you with some feedback. If you want to know, you know specifically what the jurors said about your work, um, uh, I can provide that to you. Um, and those people who are lucky enough to be selected for a studio visit, um, we call on the phone and we set up uh, an opportunity for you to let us know what day do you want your visit to happen. These are quick 20-minute studio visits. And they happen either Friday, May 25th or Saturday, May 26th. We fly the jurors here, or some of them who don't like to fly, we they drive themselves or they take the train, but somehow we get them here and um, they usually come the night before and then we spend a very two full, full days doing 16 studio visits. And if you're out state in greater Minnesota, um, we bring your work here to the Twin Cities. Um, if you're within an hour, um, very often we can get to Schaefer or if you need, if you live within that time period. But sometimes people just don't want, maybe you don't have a studio space that would be work for you, or maybe you're between spaces. And so we also offer, if you're a greater Minnesota artist, or if you just don't have a space that's adequate to hold like three jurors plus me and, and Melanie, then um, you can set up a space here at MCAD. We have a lot of white walls around here, and we have some kind of alcove spaces. And um, you're welcome to bring your work here and install it um, for the jurors to see. So we make the fellowship announcement on Monday. Uh, I should say the, the fellows are selected at the end of the Saturday. I, I don't let them get on a plane or take their train back to wherever they're from until they decide who are the, the eight fellows who will receive the fellowships. And um, then we let everybody know who did win them on Monday, June 11th. It takes us a couple weeks to get all the paperwork set up and to get a web page made and to start the publicity of trying to get the word out that um, we have some new fellows. So I've been talking a lot. Are there any questions about kind of the eligibility or about the process or um, no questions? Yeah. A question about applying? Oh, sure. Mm-hmm.
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. The question about, like, so you have, like, four bodies of work um, that you feel strongly about, that they all kind of are, 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 are good, solid, and, like, how do you choose? Like, how do you represent a 20-year-long career? And um, that's where different applicants do different things. Some applicants choose to focus on their most recent body of work. Others choose to do a sampling. There's really not a right or wrong answer. It kind of needs to be like what, I kind of think about it, like if you got a studio visit, what would you actually show them? What would you want to share with them? How would you represent yourself in that space? Because in a way, if you think of, again, this is just one way of approaching it, but thinking about it from that end, it's like, how would I put my best foot forward showing that? Because like, for example, if you have some great work from 10 years ago, but, um, you know, none of it's here, maybe you sold it, or it's just, it's ephemera, and if you couldn't represent it, then maybe don't put it in your application, because what if they fall in love with it, <laughs> right? And then you're like, and you can't talk about it, or I mean, just, there may be some things that maybe you, 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 you say, well, I would never show that in a studio visit. I think you need to think about, you know, what are you gonna share with them during that 20 minutes? And that, it doesn't need to be a one-for-one, one. you don't need to show them everything you put in your application it doesn't need to be in your studio at all. That's fine too, because often people want to show things that they're exploring, things that are in process, and that's fine too. I mean, you want those those images. What they need to do is really, again, it's I don't know. This is where you don't know what is compelling exactly, but what's the work that you think really makes your work that stands out the most? Because some of it, that first round, is, a lot of it is kind of like eye candy in a sense, right? Right. So that's where if you do ten images that are all really just the same, then they're not going to see how you might have you know, progressed over time. They might not get a sense of how you've challenged yourself or how often like one, pro one project grows into another and like one track builds on it and you, it, things become more complex or maybe you, 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 you know, so I, although I didn't give you the, some, cause some of the jurors feedback, excuse me, some of the juror criteria has been that. Sometimes we'll have a juror, that's what he or she was really looking for. They really wanted this sense of like, how are you challenging yourself over the last 10 years? And, um, Sometimes they'll critique um, applications because they're, they're too focused, that they have a sense like, wow, that was one great show you did, but what did you do before that? And where is this heading now? So as I say, but, I, but I'll, you know, Bruce is gonna talk a little bit about his application, and so I mean, he might be a better person to talk to than me, because I just, I just see it all, that's the thing. It's, it's hard for me to answer that, because I see artists who do something, everything from 2017. I see artists who do uh, projects, like four, they represent four different projects with two or three images each. And they, they, you know, I, if we look at all eight of my fellows right now, each one of them would have done something different because their practices are different. So um, what I suggest is that when you make, when you start making the, the, your 10 images, is they, they do need to visually kind of flow into each other, I think. You know, think of them as, like, because they hit, these jurors are hitting the, like, the next button, like a little arrow, like next, 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 next. So I think it helps to think of this as, like, this is like one narrative you're telling about yourself to people you don't know. Um, but if you choose to show your application to 10 different people, it'd be good to get their feedback, like people who might know your work well and people who don't know your work as well. If you have a critique group or um, Melanie and I are also available if you want to do one-on-ones, like you can upload 10 images and send us 10 other images and say, gosh, I'm really struggling with trying to figure out how this goes. And we can just, we can just give you gut instincts. You know, we're not jurors, we're not gonna have the answer, but I think it's helpful to get other people's feedback because the, these three people, these three jurors are just, to you, they're just random people, right? And you have no idea about what they're gonna like and not like. So um, I think it helps to do different iterations. Like, so do the iteration where you do a couple from each project. Do an iteration where you focus on the two most recent projects. And just see kind of what is, you know, what stands out? Where do you think someone's gonna say, wow, this is really interesting, or wow, I have no idea someone w was, wants to do this, or this, the quality of this is really high, or. This, I'm sorry, I, this probably sounds like I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, um, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I mean, my, my answer is that I really have no clear-cut suggestions. It's just that every artist, I feel like, does different work. And, um, and also different artists will say, like, one year they approach it one way and one year they do the next. Because I say most people apply multiple years. And, um, and that's always interesting to have those conversations where they, like, this year I'm going to try it this way. And, um, 
and I think they learn from that process. I mean, if you're a semifinalist, and you, even if you don't make it to the, the finalist round, it's often good to get that feedback because you can learn what these three people were th what like. What did they really like about the like like wow, I really liked image number seven, or they might complain saying like, gosh, I felt I understood where this body of work was, but this one felt it just wasn't as strong, or I didn't see the kind of development. And you're just again, it's just somebody's opinion, but it's still good to get other feedback. Does that help? Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no. Right, right. No, no. I'll get to that in a minute because I'll show you that when you upload your images, um, you 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 provide um, you upload your JPEG, and then there's this area for you to add kind of like the caption information, or your if you had an object label in a gallery where you have the title, the date, the medium, and we the year it was made, and then you also have a place where you can add comments too. That you can add some context to what they're seeing. So you can say that this is part of a series of 20 images, or this was shown at, and I'm going to have to show you an example of that in just a minute because that might. Help when you see because that pops up in their in their interface at the same time so it's no extra work for you to get an opportunity to say a little to provide a little context for that particular image and how it might relate to the next image or the image that came before it so yeah great so this is to show you what the the jurors see this kind of this is good leading into what to what we're going to show you um, you know, we have right now just our own in-house online application it's pretty it's pretty user friendly, but it's it is it's a little quirky. Um, this is what you won't see this because this is only what the jurors see. You are just a number to them. You are going to be assigned a number that's just totally random. Our webmaster sets it up. So you know when you apply, you may say, "Oh, your, your applicant number three four eight two. That number again doesn't mean anything. Um, and then when you're in this during interface, you might be a artist number one hundred. And again, it's just totally randomized. Um, this is like this index. So this is where if they give you a number they can go back to and say, oh yeah, okay, I got through these numbers. And maybe they're gonna go backwards and maybe they're gonna go in numerical order. I have no idea. Um, everybody does it differently. But most importantly, like if they click on number like one or 113, for example, this is what they would see. So they're gonna see your image. And the reason why we ask for it to be 1920 in the larger, largest dimension is that if they had a very large monitor, which they may or may not, they may have a little laptop like mine, but if they had a very large monitor, you know, 1920, pixels end up being about 26.667 inches. So it could be a very large size image if they had a big enough screen. And then on the far right, you're gonna see all this information that you've inputted in your application. So it's a title, like it says Capture One 2009. And here, um, this, is, this is an artist um, by the name of Gregory Euclid, and he was a McKnight Fellow several years ago. Um, and you know, instead of writing like mixed media, he chose to tell exactly what was in it. And he kind of did it because it's part of his practice. So again, I'm not saying everybody needs to follow Gregory's example, but he chose to do it because it kind of helps explain what it is that you're looking at. And he says you're looking at acrylic paint, a uh, paint can, a pencil, a pine needles, moss, sedum, a uh, sponge. I can't even read the other thing. Um, and then here's the measurements. He didn't say, you should put in inches or, f or if it's centimeters or if it's feet. Here he didn't, but I guess it's pretty obvious if that's a paint can, you get a sense of the scale, but you should add your own dimensions there. Um, and then this is what I was mentioning that um, there's a, a place for you to comment upon what it is they're looking at. And here he gives a sense of process, that if you just looked at this can, kind of, sort of spilled paint with this kind of landscape erupting out of it, you may not know like what, what, what's up with that. But he says here, you know, he types, writes in, the paint was poured onto the land and allowed to set. It was then dug out and a diorama of a river valley was built on top of it. And um, I think I... And in another one of his, he explains that um, you know that the, all the the objects, like the sedum, the moss, they were also collected on walks that he did, and that's part of the way he makes up his work. And so this allowed him for a chance to tell the jurors something that otherwise they're not going to know, and hopefully it piques their interest a little bit more. So you don't f don't feel obliged; you don't have to use this comment area. And I wouldn't say it if it's just being redundant. Like don't say the same thing ten times in the comment area. It's just 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 give them less to read the jurors. Don't give them more. Um, but if, it, if, if you feel like this is a way of explaining this is part of a series, a 10-part series, or maybe this is this, uh, an ongoing project you've done since, you know, you know 19, um, 
90. You know, again, I mean, you can put that under the date information or you can explain it. Um, what I do caution is don't explain away your work. Don't tell the jurors what to think about the work. Like, don't say you're going to feel that this is a sublime landscape miniaturized. It's like a Tom, Thomas Cole painting, a rub, you know, Hudson River scene. You know, don't go in and interpret and give them too much baggage. It's like this is a chance for you just to help, you know, set the scene maybe for what it is that you're doing. But don't tell them how they should feel about it or how they should intellectualize it. Because I, be, I think what good work does is it allows for a lot of people to find a lot of interesting things on their own. And you need to allow them that headspace. So um, I encourage people to use this, but then I also kind of say don't do it to an extreme where you become overly didactic. And this is where they can see, you know, the number of images, and they can click on statement, and that will download. Um, and they can click on resume, and that will download. And I do have usually one out of the three jurors will say that they actually looked at almost everybody's statement and resume just because they just needed to know a little bit more about them. But then the other two didn't. And so that's where, again, in this first round, you just don't know. In the second round, they're expected to, and usually um, they will talk about it. Like they'll say, oh, I felt like the statement, you know, just didn't reinforce what I was seeing in the images. Or they might mention that it was, it was really vague about what they were going to do with the fellowship. They didn't seem to really have a plan. Um, so, um, and then the resume is really the least important in terms of it's not, they're not going to say, well, you have to have, I need to see that you've shown it X, Y, Z. You know, our jurors don't come in with those kinds of expectations. Um, but the resume is, is for them to get a sense that, you know, you've put yourself out there, that you've had some success, that again, you know, that you're ambitious. Um, and, and we here at Melanie and I review to make sure that the resume looks like you've been a resident for at least the year preceding. So if you just graduated uh, and have an MFA from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, you know, maybe I'm going to um, question, like, have you been here a year? And if we have those questions, we actually call you on the phone and we have a conversation about it. Um, so that's what we also use the resumes for in order to determine eligibility. And this is where the jurors give you um, a, a score. And you're scored not just for the in individual image, you're, it's an overall score. So it's not like, oh, Pate can gets a five, whereas other landscape gets a two. That's not how it works. They give you an overall score, one to five. And this is their little comment area right here. So, Any questions about what the jurors are seeing as a part of their interface? Um, and then they also have this image list. I'm actually not sure why we include this image list, <laughs> but um, the jurors do get to see just a um, synopsis of what you had written here. But I guess, again, I, I think I included this here just so you ought to see that Gregory wrote a lot for each and every one of the images that he uploaded. Um, one of them was an installation scene. Like he wrote here that this was an installation at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City overlooking Central Park, and it consisted of several dioramas made from materials collected from walks, paper casts of boulders. So again, he's giving a lot of information. So he, he, it was an installation scene from a, a group exhibition he was a part of. So again, you can include installation images, and if you want to say where it was, you know, it helps maybe draw their attention, like, oh, wow, that's pretty, that's impressive, or oh, this was a solo show, or oh, it was, um, it makes them, because it's kind of reinforcing things that they're going to see perhaps in your resume. Um, So, and then if you if you do video work and you upload something to YouTube, I have a lot of questions often. Is if like do you have to create some an, um, alias account or something? But you don't. I mean, you just give us your URL, and our webmaster works her magic, and sh she blots out everything else, and it just comes up as a screen like this, where you type in you've typed in your information, which is the same that you would for a static image, um, a title, a medium, a date, a duration, and here again you can explain what it is we're looking at and. Um, and this is what's referencing. I mentioned that it needs to be, this is, you should use this area here, your words here, your little spaces here to probably reference what static image one through 10 is this referencing. Yeah, so he had included, this artist had included an image of a church pew with headphones. And, and this goes with the same installation. This video goes with it, if that makes sense. So. So that's what the jurors see there. And now I'll turn this over to Bruce. He can entertain you for a couple of minutes and you can ask him questions about what, so Bruce is one of my current uh, 2017 fellows. So one of the eight um, who have not even yet had any of their studio visits yet with their visiting critics, but the first one comes next week. So anyways, we've just uploaded his um, application so you can see it. So. Yeah, you can, I mean, you can press the buttons if you want to show some of your. What else is on there, okay. Yeah. Just so, stay away. Yeah, so like that's 
the first image. So this is like if, if oh, you yeah. guys go online and log in, this is what you're going to, this, this is um, what you can see yourself. This isn't what the jury sees, this is what you're seeing. So okay, you gotcha. A bit about yourself and Hi guys. Um, so uh, yeah, Carrie asked if I'd come over and uh, talk a little bit about my experience of it. Um, I, everything that I've heard from Carrie sounds about right to me. I mean, maybe you all think that the images come first. I tend to think that too. And if you've ever been on one of those uh, committee or some sort of jurors group where you're looking at stuff, you know, the, the reading does tend to come afterwards. So uh, good slides was is the key, I think. And I've, I've, I've applied with bad slides and I've applied with good slides. and. I haven't had good images this time, so I was pretty glad of that. Um, um, the studio visit, one thing, a couple things that caught my ear when you were talking, Carrie, the studio visit, so 20 minutes, it is really short, man. Those people show up and you're just meeting them and, um, you know, so there's there's definitely nerves. I felt nerves every time and, uh, um, but it goes by really fast. So so if, it, if you did, uh, if you make it to that point, I'd say that is something to consider being pretty prepped for when the people show up because that time man you know it just goes like that so if you have stuff laid out and you want to show works from um, you know the uh, different era or something like that if you have it ready to rumble I think I maybe had like three little stations in my studio um, where I was showing different aspects of the work that I was at wanting to see but I, I had it all ready to go which made it possible to try to cram it in there in that in that short of time um, Carrie told me some things that I did wrong, which I thought was really funny. Like I didn't use, I put mixed media. I had these little sculptures. I put mixed media. <laughs> didn't really talk about what was in them at all. Um, and so, I don't know. In the past, I guess maybe I've talked about that more, but this time I didn't. Um, what might be good, Carrie? What can, what can, what do you want to sure. sure, talk so, about? So like, so these are some of the so I mean, just talk a little bit about like what you chose, like okay. so, so like this again. This sorry, it's just a small image, but you can tell it's an installation image. Like, why start with that? Like, what was? Do you have an idea okay. of why you chose to do that? I did. I I just recently. That's probably connected to how I actually had decent images because I'm a pretty bad image taker, um, because they mostly came from an exhibition that I had right uh, previous to the application dates, and so that was. Uh, that really helped me a lot. And I started, I did have a couple installation shots of this uh, show. And I think because I referenced in my statement a little bit of my past work and my work had changed what I thought was fairly dramatically just in terms of how I went about making it um, before this last application. Um, and and I referenced the, my past work as a, you know, I was pretty involved with installation, but I wasn't showing any of that. But I kind of felt like, uh, maybe you feel that way too. Like it was a part of my real personality as an artist, and I, I felt like I was compelled to have some aspect like of the other activities I did besides just painting. And so then I think that's probably why I showed, started off with the installations. And then these shots were kind of good for that too, because in the back there was a couple, a couple of the installation shots for the sculptures had the, some of the paintings that I didn't have room to put in my tent. So I kind of cheated a little bit that way I guess I'm just trying to get more information in front of the jurors eyes uh, that way and I don't know if there's any more I guess I'll see oh yeah there is so um, yeah so then some individual shots so I had a couple group shots just to give the vibe that you know maybe uh, the installation was a consideration which it, it, it is for me and then um, a couple individual shots and I think maybe the rest were painting so probably three sculptural shots and and the rest were just individual painting shots um, and that helped a little bit. Um, I think the statement, I think Carrie said that too, and it, you've probably felt this before if you've written many of them. Uh, short and sweet is probably a pretty good way to think about it. Um, and again, I, I, I agree with uh, what Carrie's saying. I, I just try not to make any uh, big claims about how the work is operating on the viewer and, and see if you can just keep it down to uh, the way that you think about the work and what's important to you in the work, I think could help. And I felt like, uh, um, I don't know how, how much you love writing an artist statement, but I, I've never really loved writing them. And they always, it's, they're strange. And, um, and this last one that I, I wrote, I was pretty proud of, and I thought somehow, and it might just be because I'm getting old or something, but I finally found a way to uh, say specifically like what was maybe behind the work, but not really what that body of work was about. And so what was behind it was just more personal thoughts about the, arc of being an artist or something like that and and how I kind of thought 
the work that I've been making currently really didn't it, it didn't want a certain kind of explanation and basically that was my statement was basically getting out of making a statement somehow you know um, so I, I think I said I was I, I liked what I said because I felt it was forceful and felt like it was um, it was true to how I was feeling uh, which is a rare for me that that feeling when I'm writing a statement so so that was good but it was definitely short and I've taken some my wife is also an artist and I've seen her write a couple of like three sentence statements that I've always been you know so envious of and uh, so I tried to keep it down to about, about a paragraph and, and I, I, I think that um, as far as the statement goes that probably helped a little bit um, the order of events I did do a little bit what you said so you get your images lined up and I did just make a couple little combo packs of images that filled up that 10 and just ran through them myself and just try to think about you know the pace of that and and uh, how easy it was to pay attention from from the changes from one piece to another so it did I was looking to have a have a little bit of a flow um, I've won the, uh, the McKnight uh, in, the, in the past, it was a long time ago, but, uh, and I think, you know, as a younger, so I, all those problems I had back, back then, I think, were, uh, were similar with writing statement and, I, uh, and taking my own images, so, so I don't know. Good images, I think, if you can spend some time doing something uh, that's probably really useful in terms of your application is to work on those images until you get them feeling like they're pretty representative and you're pretty satisfied with them. Um, because that is really the entry point. And I, I, I'm sure you can all imagine, because I can imagine the clicky, clicky, click as you're going through, because there's a lot of images to look at. Um, I think if you could find some way to maybe track someone's attention, also you said that too, Carrie. If you can get to that second phase, um, you know, that is really where you can, you can um, provide more information and more of a vibe about your, your real thought process about making work. So, so maybe save some of that for, for you know, down the road. Uh, some if you have a lot of explaining to do, or a lot of connections to make with past work, or, or other people's work, or something like that. That probably it seems to me I could be wrong, but it seems to me that would be um, best done in person, talking to the people. And uh, if it's possible to, um, this is all rando advice. Uh, if it's possible to. Uh, have your studio visit at your studio because that was mentioned uh, if, if you do have a studio or space to show I really uh, always liked that because I feel like I don't know what the nature of your studio is but you know mine it, it tends to you know it's kind of a personal space so it collects the things that I'm interested in and I always feel like that's a little extra bonus so that's been an extra bonus to have someone come to my place and and see the work that I'm showing them but also just sort of be in that space because I think that space, you can kind of make some connections to how that, the things I like sort of inform the, uh, what I'm doing at any particular time. So, so if it comes to that and you have that option, I think that's a pretty nice option. Um, I guess we could look at another picture just so we that point. <laughs> Once again, I said mixed media. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I had a title. Oh, yeah, I did have a title. Um, yeah, so I don't know what that was. I'm really bad on the computer, and that might be an age thing too. So I really need help and a tech team, which I don't really have. Um, I got my application, I think maybe every time, and at the very last second. Uh, so if you're down to it, you know, I was. I, I think I pressed the go button about three minutes before the deadline. Um, man, you know, you're just home freaking out, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but you know, so that's it. I don't know. That's. Uh, Maybe you guys have some questions. I don't know. That's not maybe too informative. I'd say best images that you can come up, up with, f fill around with that statement until it's something that you're not embarrassed to tell somebody else. Uh, seriously, you know, where you're just talking about yourself in some way that you never do in real life. Yeah. I think, and, the, and, and you said too, Carrie, I think that's really true. You kind of, you know, where we live and whatnot and the kind of contact we have, you kind of tend to think of people that come from the coast these big institutions have maybe a different kind of animal, but I, I really do think like uh, trying to be honest and trying to be yourself is the best bet. And then, uh, I, I mean, and the, and the last thing, maybe the last thing I'll say if, uh, is that I, I've said I have some uh, teach, so I have some students, and I, I've had this discussion with them sometimes when they ask questions about applying for stuff. And just from my experience, the times I feel like I've applied for things where I'm 
sort of crafting this image of myself and putting it out there and trying to trying to second guess maybe what the jurors might like and you know, and if you're someone that makes a lot of work, it kind of covers a lot of territory, that's really tricky because then maybe you pick, oh, maybe there's someone will like this one, and then from over here, maybe someone will like that. The times I've done that and, and lost, the, uh, I, it, it's, it's, it's hard to deal with. And the times I've, I've gotten sort of behind myself and just did what I thought was, you know, more representative of me without that guessing who might like what and how I might get over on this group of people. Um, the times I was the most honest, that even when I lost, you walk away feeling pretty good, you know, because it was like, oh, that was me. And, and, and that's the other thing, too. It's like you can only be who you are, kind of. That's some old man advice, I guess. <laughs> but you can kind of only be who you are. And, and I feel like sometimes I'm, I, maybe you've done it too, but I feel like, you know, you, you try to, you work on this presentation and um, someone's either going to like what you do, get what you do, or not get what you do. And I think that that's almost the part you don't have to, what are you going to do about it? You, you know, you, that's the part you can't worry about. Um, so if you can find just your true I feel like you're telling the truth about yourself and showing work that you're really proud of and you think like, don't have any thoughts about what the jurors are going to think. Just get behind yourself, I would say. And, uh, and then even if you get it or you don't get it, if, you, if, you, if you've made up stories about yourself and you don't get it, you feel like a putz. And if you tell the truth about yourself and you don't get it, you feel okay. That's, that's, <laughs> that's my experience. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Thank you and sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions for Bruce? <laughs> show some more of your images. Okay, Thank you, thanks, though. Yeah. yeah, you said um, we have, I, I didn't, I just want to show one other bigger image of, um, is if you haven't been inside the um, application site, you as a uh, applicant have the chance to see your thumbnail bigger. So I would encourage you to, you know, click on it and make sure it's not blurry and that it's you know, not akimbo or things like that. So, um, you know, it, it seems those seem like super basic things, but they're just things that I know when you're busy and if you do it at the last minute to hit submit, you may not take the time to do it. So um, I would encourage you to, to, to not wait to the last minute. Um, only one year did we actually have a system crash, but that was one time too many. Um, so I hope it won't ever happen again. I'm sure not because we got smarter after that. But um, it, it is best if you kind of go in, get acquainted with the application, make sure you're understanding that your images need to be set at certain dimensions so that they upload quickly and easily. Because what happens is that last day, the system, if there's lots of people, and um, wherever you are, your, you, your computer could just be taking a long time to upload images. And we don't want you to, to get you know, cut off because we actually have an automatic system where it ha it's not me turning on the off the switch it's it's just automated and if you are in the last minute of uploading your last image and it doesn't take i can't do anything about that so you need to get those 10 images uploaded so not to put the fear of god in you or anything but um anyways but yeah just to see that Again, you had a very tight body of work. And like I say, it's, it's, our jurors are also not consistent. Like they will harp on one artist for being like, oh, I just, I don't have a sense of where this work is coming from. Like, I wish I had an earlier body of work to, to know where it evolved out of. And other artists, like, you know, for Bruce, it didn't matter. Like it was such a really strong body of work um, that they're like, heck, this guy's great. <laughs> so um, as I say, they're not gonna be consistent looking at X number of, of applicants, they're, they're going to make judgments based on all kinds of things. Um, we're very inconsistent humans. Um, but I think, I mean, one thing to say about your work, though, too, is that, I mean, there's a, although, it, yeah, it's oil on canvas or there's these mixed media sculptures, what you're seeing, there's a lot of variety within them. They're not, it's not like it's a repetitious body of work. I mean, it, it's doing a lot of different things. Each image is kind of a world unto itself, literally. So. Um, and you've talked about high quality, and that is really what matters. And this is, I'm just giving you a smattering of some of the fellows that I have the joy of working with right now. Um, Harriet Bart, Andy Doucette, um, David Goldies, Terry Guideson, um, uh, Jeremy Lundquist, he's a uh, Tamsi Ringler, uh, Peter Shahalski, and Bruce, you already know. 
Um, these are some other fellows I'm also working with. So it's our 2016 fellows who last year had six people come in, and then this is the year that they're inviting back four. Um, they're Eric Benson and Julie Buffalohead. They're the ones who'll be talking on June 1st. Um, Leah, um, we should have paired them with their people, but uh, Lee is talking on the 16th. Um, T is talking on the 23rd. Uh, Monica Holler. You know, it's interesting because, I mean, this image on the left, you know, I wouldn't say it looks like a great image in terms of like, oh, it's not a great photograph. But, I mean, she's, she's doing this um, a site-specific kind of installation um, in Louisiana. And um, so it's not as if, like, each image, you know, for some artists you might have a, a practice that, you know, the, the high-quality image, she didn't have a professional photographer with her in um in New Orleans when she was doing this project. So, you know, but for her, it didn't matter, right? Because the body of her work, she, she sh had to show multiple aspects of what she was doing. She was actually like drawing dirt out. And that was a part of it, it was about flooding and Hurricane Katrina. And so, and again, everybody's art is different and your practice is different and your images are gonna represent that. And, and Jay Hykus, and when he here too was showing um, an installation shots. Now installation shots are good, I think, often for giving a sense of scale too. So that's the thing I think is also really good because you got a sense that again, even all, all the, because when you're looking at an image and it pops up on their viewer screen or whatever, and although it says, you know, inches versus centimeters versus, you know, feet, if you remember to add those dimensions, um, it's still visually you know, people, it's hard to ascertain. It really is. So, um, again, don't have an installation image if you, just, just to have one, but if it really does give a sense of scale or gives a sense of the body in relationship to the work, um, I would say that's probably a good way to go. Um, other McKnight Fellows, uh, Paul Herr, um, she also has a show opening at Midway <laughs> this coming on the, the 10th. Um, Caroline Kent, a uh, painter. Uh, even earlier fellows. I'm just trying to show you the broad range that I think of broad range of work that we have photographers, we have painters, we have installation artists. Um, we have a little bit of everything. And, and this is Christina Estelle's work. She created these blue silicon sheets that she installed in the Fergus Falls Mental Hospital. Uh, Scott Nedrolo, Kelly O'Brien, Selma Fernandez Richter, uh, Alexandros Lindsay, Louise Fitch, Tracy Crum, yeah, so you never know what those jurors are gonna like. And um, and it's interesting, like some of the fellows I'll mention too, like Peter Shahosky had been a finalist one year in 2015 and didn't get it, but then he did get it well, in 2017. And I know artists often get discouraged. They're like, oh my gosh, I came close and I didn't get it. You know, just why do I even apply? But I'm glad people do continue to apply because you just, the way, one way you know you're never gonna get this is if you never apply. That's the only thing I can tell you. Um, now, poor image quality, these are not actual images that I've ever received. This is just like cold from the internet. But this is an installation image that's not going to do your work justice, so you don't need to include anything like this. So, um, you know, if it's dark, if it doesn't show your work, if it's the balustrade and the lighting system are more evident than the art, then don't include it. But, um, and also, this is some, this again, this is not a real piece that's been ever um, installed or in, in, in submitted, but I just want to point out, we, I do, do see work though that's not evenly lit, like they'll have a, like a hot spot right here and then be very dark in other parts of it, or that won't be cropped well, like it'll be, and again, some artists, I mean, you're, you, the way you want your work is it might be on the floor propped up, like that might be the way you want it to be seen and that's perfectly fine, but don't, don't let that distract from the work if that's not part of the aesthetic. So, um, and that's where like bartering with somebody who does take good photos or just investing in, um, in that might make, does make a, a big difference. So I would just repeat what um, Bruce said. And he also said a really interesting thing where he was saying kind of like, I've, I've described something about that idea that going from like the first round to the second round to the third round, there's no like magic oh, a formula for it. But one thing that I think does happen is that the art, that the jurors get, are, are continually intrigued by what it is that you're doing. And that's like they want to do a studio visit with you. So it's kind of like that idea, you're right, that like of like you have this, this mystery thing. Like, you know, you don't want to tell everything. That's like, well, you don't want to regurgitate everything in your artist statement and everything in the caption information so that you've explained away everything there is to say about your work because you want to leave something for that studio visit. Because the idea is they're like, wow, I'm interested in the work, I'm going to give this work a four. Which if you get a four, that's a, you, you, yeah, that's a pretty good chance you might make it to the semifinal round. Um, and in that semifinal round, you know, again, they're reading your resume, they're like, oh wow, I'm, I know a little bit about you, but I, there's still more I want to see. I want to do a studio visit. Because one of the 
I do hear from jurors when they're in this deliberation, like how do we narrow it down to the top 16 finalists, is they say like, I think I know what I'm gonna see. And that's a terrible way of being like, cut from being a finalist, but it's, it's a sense like they already kind of know exactly what, you, because you've given them a, already a real good sense of, of what it is, and there's not that little air of either intrigue or, I don't know, mystery, or just wanting to know more about, have a conversation with you about like, where is this coming from? Or, wow, I, how did you do that? Or, you know, because if you say, how do you suspend that kind of fulfillment of wanting to kind of know more about you? Don't do it all in the first round. So it's kind of the same thing you were talking about. Okay, well, this is the kind of the, the rest of what I have to say is really about the technical side of applying. Like, I'm really going to go through the step by step um, because I'd like to have this on, on videotape so people who um, might not have ever applied before or um, you know, have some hesitations about using our system. So, I'll give you this opportunity that if you have any questions, I know. You know, ask me, and if you leave now, I think it's perfectly fine. I'm not gonna, you're not hurting my feelings or anything. Um, it's giving you an out, because this is gonna be really just the nuts and bolts of like, this is what you do in step one, and this is what you do in step two. So, um, anyone else with questions about any parts of the, the process? You're good, huh? Okay. Well, thank you, for those of you who came for, for this part of it, thank you for coming. And um, now I'm gonna go through the technical aspects of applying, so. Um, if you log on to mcad.edu backslash McKnight, it takes you to this landing page. It's not the prettiest page. It's kind of boring, actually. Um, but we have this beautiful logo from the McKnight Foundation, and I have to say they are an amazing foundation that have been supporting artists for 36 years in this way. And they also, they support the, the, all of the regional arts councils. They support probably every arts organization that exists in the Twin Cities, it seems, or Greater Minnesota. So um, anyways, they're a fabulous, fabulous foundation, and we are lucky to have them here. Um, but anyways, if you click on this, there's two ways of getting to our application site, uh, where you get to upload your application. That's, you could hit the apply button, or you could hit this orange thing here. No, I'm lying. This is not an actual screenshot of what it looks like today. This is what it looked like before we actually um, uploaded it saying the application site is now open. So you can either click on that word or you can click on the word apply. Let's pretend you hit on the word apply. This is what it takes you to. Um, so this is our application site and um, this just gives you information about it. It tells you that you can download the guidelines and that we the PDF that I have, I'm working off of right now, we will upload to our website so that you can download that too if you want it as a frame of reference. We always mention the de de application deadline. Um, it's at noon. They can make a note of it now. And what you first are gonna do is you're gonna, you're gonna you know, fill out an entry form. And um, first, if you go to entry form, if you've already, um, even if you applied last year, we don't save your information from last year, so you start anew. So the first thing you're gonna do, if this is the first time you've come into the application site, you click here, it says create an account. And then it'll take you here. And you just put your name, last name, email, password, another password, you hit submit. Takes you to the entry form. You fill it out. Um, you give us information. Um, we, for demographics information, the McKnight Foundation likes us to um, uh, have some ideas about your date of birth, um, your gender, how you, um, your, let's see what else might be, your ethnicity. Um, those are things that we use in-house. It's not shared with the jurors. This is not information that they see. This is a, a blind application, so they don't see your name at all um, in the application. Um, after you do that, you can start uploading your images. And you can go in whatever order you want. We kind of do it so that it makes sense kind of doing images first because that's what we already told you that's the most important thing your optional video your optional pdf then your resume then your statement um but you can actually once you're in here you can toggle back and forth and do whatever you like um, uploading images you do one at a time you need to um you can upload an image first you upload an image and then you can go in and add the title medium date um, but you can't just add in the caption information. It won't let you go to the next image to upload until you actually find an image to upload. <laughs> so that's where you choose a file. If you do it correct, this is what it will look like. You might have a cat. 
up here. Um, untitled, inkjet print, the date, dimensions. And that's once you've uploaded something, um, you can edit it. You can hit edit. And you can go in and say, oh, that wasn't done in 2008, seven, or 16. It was done in 2018. Or you can change the dimensions, or you can go in and add information. So you can also delete it. If you're like, oh, I didn't mean to do that at all, I'm going to delete the whole thing. Once you've uploaded one image, you can upload a second. So it goes back to the, directly below it, you'll see the opportunity to upload a second image. If you do something wrong, you're gonna get something that says error. It might tell you that you need to get it to be 1920 pixels, or it might be that your image is too big. Because very often, if you wanna start with good images. Some of those images are ginormous. I mean, they, they could just be you know, a gigabyte or something. We don't, our, fortunately, our system cannot upload an image that's a gigabyte. We have a limit of 1.9 megabytes. So um, if you have a problem, you need to be, I'll show you that in a minute, how to save your images so that they're small enough to upload. We're not going to diminish the quality. They're still going to be high-quality images, but they're just looking at it a screen. They're not going to be printing them off and making posters for you or anything. So they, can, they just need to be um, for web quality. Um, but so... Again, the two error messages you will get is if you didn't do it, didn't um, get one of the dimensions to be 1920, um, and also if it's bigger than 1.9. Um, so, and if you have any problems with that, you're welcome to call us or email us and say, "Gosh, I'm having trouble," because very often just walking through with you um, solves those problems. Um, the video link is the very same thing as a static image in terms of what you upload, but you just are providing you the link to your YouTube. And also, sometimes people make things password protected, and you need to, they need to be public. Um, this is where you'd upload an additional PDF, um, your resume. And we have different formats. They, don't, they can be a rich text format, a Word document, a PDF. We do ask that you not add your name, like although very often on a resume that you would be sending to an employer, you're going to add your name and your email and your website and all that other good stuff. We want none of that on it. It's OK if your name appears farther down, like maybe you had a solo show and your name was in it. That's OK. Um, you know, it would be best if you eradicated your name so it doesn't kind of influence the artist, but what, I mean, the juror, but we're most interested in is not having, again, your data up there for them to get. We don't want them going elsewhere, like looking up your work on a website. Um, so again, Melanie and I, um, if we see that your name is on your, the resume, um, we can download it, take it off, and upload it again um, as a backdoor person. or. Um, We'll do that if you've already hit submit and we go through these and we make sure that people have done it right. If we review these as they come in, so if it's two weeks away from the deadline and we notice that you've done that wrong, we'll let you know and say, hey, you know what, you um, send us another resume because this resume has you know, your contact information on it. Um, so we will do that for you, we'll let you know. But as I say, if it's after the deadline, after March 30th, then we just we can clean that up ourselves and take off your name and the like. But we do let you know, like, for example, sometimes people accidentally upload two resumes or two artist statements. And so we'll let you know that. And we give ourselves four days to go through all of the applications before we turn them over to the juror. So we will make sure that if there's a problem, we'll alert you to that problem. Because so we want to make sure that you're all, you know, on, your materials are all there. Artist statement, again, we just ask that you don't put your name on the top of it. Um, lots of different file types that you can upload. Um, pretty basic. We, can, we kind of assume that you should be mentioning what artistic direction you're headed in, just so the jurors are not leaping to conclusions in, in that kind of second round before they have the chance to, to meet you in the final round. Um, and we also ask about eligibility, and we, we just want you to be honest that, um, you know, that you're at least 18 years of age, that you've lived here for a year, and um, if you've won a McKnight before, you have to wait out five years, and so we ask you, and also you can't apply for more than one McKnight in one given year, so you can't apply to McKnight, like maybe you're a, an artist who uses clay, and you said, wow, I could apply for the ceramics one, and I could apply for the visual arts one, and no, you actually can't. You have to choose which category you want to be in. Um, we actually offer different types of things, and so it's kind of a choice as to which one might fit your needs best. Um, so um, the ones that 
often that's an overlap. And the other one that could be an overlap is if you are um, a filmmaker or if you do other kind of media arts, like maybe you do game design or maybe you um, things that are um, media based. Um, IF, former IFP, Minnesota, they've changed their name. Um, to what is it, True North? <laughs> no, it's not, I'm not trying to remember that. Um, I'm embarrassed that I just forgot the name. But anyways, they have, they sponsor their own McKnight Media Arts, uh, McKnight. So that's sometimes people have an overlap there where their people are moving into doing only video work and they're long, you know, they're, they're not doing mixed media that goes along with it and say so that might be a better fit for you. Um, so if you have questions about that, you're also welcome to ask us. But um, you, we ask you to be honest and be click this little eligibility that you accept, that you're confirming that you are who you say you are, and all will be merry. Um, if you've done everything right, then you get little check marks. If you've forgotten to do something, it won't let you hit submit. Like if you forgot to upload your resume. Again, our system doesn't know that resume could actually be your shopping list. It's not smart enough to know like what the content of that sheet of paper is that you've uploaded, but um, of that virtual sheet of paper. But um, it does know if nothing's there. Um, Oops, I meant to show you that we also now you can download your form. Like if you want to remember what did I what did I down what did I upload and in what order, um, those are all those can be sent to you if you click this little button here. You download it, it'll be sent to you, and then you'll have it as a reference point. And then once you're happy with everything, then you hit submit and you have a complete submission. So, and it tells you when you finished and when you hit click. So. That's that. Um, formatting images. Again, I'm going to go over that real quickly because I was talking about this. Oh, you got to get your image to be 1920 pixels. And it's like, what? What's that about? Well, I'm going to show you based on Photoshop. There's other different um, editing programs, but this is um, the one that we have access to. Um, I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't used a lot of other processes, but. Um, what we're trying to do is get the image size to a particular dimension so it can be, so our system likes it. It's the same one that they use for CAFE, which is um, a, a number of artists do use in order to submit their images um, to different types of calls for applications. But we're, what we're focusing on is this image size here. So what I'm, the image I have here, this is the work of a previous McKnight Fellow. Um, it's an installation view of a of a, um, a work by Catherine Meyer where she's projected a drawing of hers onto the Iowa or a Nebraska landscape. Um, so you hit image size and what we need to do is the width is up here, the height is here, and neither of those are the pixels they need to be. So we're going to change the width up here. No, we're not. Excuse me. We're going to change it down here. So first you're going to unclick resample image because you see here these things are often all clicked. You're going to click that and we're going to resample it. And we're going to change the this here. Well, first we're going to change the resolu resolution. It's 300 which is very high resolution image. Okay, first we're going to change it to 72. Then we're going to re-click again resample image. And then we're going to go up here. Sorry, so first we're going, to we're going to decrease the resolution to 72, and that's kind of the standard for print viewing, I mean, excuse me, web viewing. And then we're going to go up here and change, since this is a horizontal photograph that she's submitting of this particular installation that she did in the landscape, um, we're going to make, because we clicked constrained proportions, it means that whatever you do to one is automatically going to happen for the other. So if we change the width, it'll automatically kind of maintain the proportion and make the height whatever it needs to be. Um, so we're just going to change the width to 1920 and hit OK. And it often looks like it shrunk it down and made it smaller, but again, you don't have to freak out and worry about it. It's going to be a very fine image indeed. Um, then you go to File, and we save here for different versions of um, Photoshop. It's sometimes it's not safe for web. It may be some other kind of designation. Maybe it may say safe, safe for web and devices, um, some of them say. But the reason for that is, again, um, it's that you can kind of decrease the quality in order to, to make it a smaller image. Because even if you make it 1920 and you drop it to 72, if your image started out just as a ginormous high quality image, it still may be over 1.9 megabytes. But if you save for web and devices, then it shrinks that file even more so. Um, 
And what you want to do is up here, we want to make sure you're working with a JPEG. So make sure this says JPEG up here. And the quality, usually you can have it anywhere between 60 and 80, and that's perfectly fine. And you also want to make sure it's converted to RGB here. That's usually the default. Here, you can slide it as a slider type thing, or you can go up and down in order to get at the quality. But as I say, you can increase it to 80, but it may not even need to be that big. Um, and you can save, and you can save it however you want. We don't see how you save it. It might be like, gosh, I just want to call it Jerome, I mean, McKnight 1, so I know it's the first image that I'm uploading to my application. You can, it doesn't matter what you title it. We're not going to see it. It's just for your own classificatory purposes. So you save it, and it hopefully will be fine. Um, we'll see. Are there any questions about kind of that process of uploading images and... As I say, the two error messages that people get is if either the file's too big or it's just not, it's one of the dimensions is not 1920. That's usually our biggest problem. So, well, thank you for coming. And if you have questions, you know, don't hesitate to email us at gallery at mcad.edu or you can call me on, on my number at MCAD or Melanie's. And um, we have postcards that are people are welcome to take if, if I don't know if you got some in the mail but um, you're welcome to take those those have our contact information on them as well and as I say we're able to meet with people and do like give feedback up until about you know we can do one out up to one hour sessions up to about two weeks before the the deadline but after that point we often get so busy just want we want to make sure people who are who just have are having problems like with the technical side of things just they get their application in again we're happy to review things but we can't often do a face-to-face -face or a really in you know in-depth kind of feedback about um if you have questions um, about you know the order of your images or you want somebody to, to read over your artist statement as I say if you get that to us um, you know two weeks before the deadline that gives us enough time to to make an appointment and look over things give some feedback